Well, um, that's the whole idea, Henry, right? If you learn how to analyze banks, you can analyze them one after another. Canadian banks are, are solid, right? A bank fails because it can't meet its liquidity requirements. So if a depositor wants their money back and the bank doesn't have the liquidity to provide the deposit, then that's you know basically how a bank fails. A bank can also be declared failed by a regulator. So I guess, you know, there is an auction going on for SVBs. Yeah, I mean, I think the bailout talk is, I see it both ways. I see it as obviously a bad thing in the sense that, you know, we shouldn't encourage poor management to be, like these guys basically took this risk for this extra reward and they basically said, well, you know, if, if the worst happens, we have to, you know, we'll get, uh, we'll get bailed out. Like, I, obviously, like that's not... All these other companies are more prudent. So it's really not not fair, right? On the flip side, I, I certainly don't want to see all their customers get get annihilated, right? For no reason. I mean, that's a pretty serious disruption to America. So it's, it's you know, if this were an easy decision, it would be an easy decision. But I don't think, you know, it's that easy. You know, you could definitely see it both ways. You don't want to encourage moral hazard. You don't want to encourage everyone moving to the two big banks. Um, but at the same time, you got to let people punish themselves, right, with bad moves. So it's a very dog-eat-dog kind of world. So the thing about banks is the whole point of the bank is book value. I really told myself I would not open up a bank SEC filing. I really don't want to do that. A bank, book value is just assets, right, minus liabilities. And the problem with book value is it's very hard to measure with most uh, banks. It's very easy to measure everywhere else, right, when we pull up the assets as I've done hundreds of times here, when I pull up the assets and liabilities of a, of a company, it's fairly easy to tell what's a real asset and what's a real liability. Let's do it really quick with Mylan, and you guys will get a sense for like what I'm talking about maybe. So let me uh, pull up some numbers here real quick that are not the balance sheet. So remember, there are three financial statements, right? The big three. Income statement, balance sheet, and what else? You guys know, my, my kid is going to know this when my kid is like four years old. Cash flow statement. Good, good. Everybody knows. That's good. Income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement. Some people say the Holy Trinity, right? Um, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, right? For me, it's the uh, income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. There's some differences between these, um, there's some differences between these uh, statements. The income statement is what I'm looking at now. The income statement is so-called period statement. Right, a period is a period of time. And so the income statement discusses or displays the company's results over a period of time. So this is the revenue, which is kind of the first item of the income statement, which most people call top line sometimes, because it's literally the top line. And it's the revenue. So this is how much company product was sold. And this is a drug company. This was called Mylan, but they merged Mylan with a part of Pfizer called Upjohn to create this new company called Viactris, which is like a very corporate uh, name. And so we're going to look at the income statement of uh, Viatris. Then we're going to look at the balance sheet. Maybe we start with the balance sheet. It's up to you. I'd rather finish off this income statement because I have delinquent on my work here. And so you can see the period snapshot, right? There was a, there's a period of time that this accounts for, and this is accounting for the annual period. And this makes sense because this is their annual report called the SEC Form 10K. And we'll look at a 10K for a bank a little later just because you guys really want me to. And you can see like this company mainly sells um, generic drugs. So the prices are really low, the costs are relatively high, and you can see that the margins are therefore quite low. It's not like a normal pharmaceutical company with high margins. What do you think the gross margin is? We calculate gross profit divided by revenue, and it's 40%, which is a lot lower than your average drug company. Before the merger with uh, Upjohn was like 30%. So it must be that Upjohn's margins were around 50% because the average is now 40%. I hope you can all see this. Um, and the merger happened here. That's why the company's revenue almost doubled. And Pfizer was basically got rid of their old, their old drugs like Lipitor. So Pfizer no longer owns Lipitor. Uh, this company, uh, Viatris does. Uh, ticker is VTRS in case you're interested in looking at that. Anyway, the nice thing about having a generics company is that you don't have any real R&D costs compared to a pharmaceutical company. So you can see that their R&D is pretty slim. And the uh, SG&A is, is actually pretty, pretty large, in my opinion, for this kind of a company that should be just a little bit more lean. 
But the thing about this company is they've had a lot of international presence, so it costs them a lot of money to kind of have that big international presence. They also have a mountain of debt, and you can see that here. 500 million in interest here, 600 here, 592 here. So quite a lot of debt. Um, and the question is, will they ever really be able to pay that off? So it's a pretty messy um, balance sheet. You can see the shares outstanding also doubled because the merger with with uh, Pfizer's Upjohn division basically gave Pfizer shareholders a bunch of stock in this company, Mylan, which they renamed as uh, Viatris because part of the reason was they had this bad, bad EpiPen uh, drama over price increases. So they kind of became a casualty there. All right, let's look at the balance sheet because when it comes to banks, then this is, so this was sort of the first of the holy trinity, the income statement. You have revenue, you have costs, and you get all the way down to the bottom line, which is net income or profit. Uh, so you sell stuff, it costs you money to sell the stuff, it costs you money to run the company in general, and you're left over with some profit at the end. And the profit's a lot less than the revenue, obviously. So let's look at the other part of the Holy Trinity, the balance sheet, and we want to pay really close attention to that. Well, cash is really easy to understand, right? Cash is worth what it's worth. So, but then you notice it says this one line here, if you could zoom in, Maybe you got the magnifying glass. Do you got the magnifying glass, camera guy? All right, let's get let's let's magnify. Cash and equivalents. What is cash and equivalents? What does that mean? Cash and equivalents. I think that's something that's equivalent to cash. Well, what's equivalent to cash, right? I don't know. Um, that's a tough one. Um, and it doesn't matter so much in industrial companies, right? Because at the end of the day, like how much cash. Pfizer or Merck or Viatris or one of these industrial companies has, doesn't really make a difference. Um, but how much cash a bank has does make a big difference. So this is just a, a pill company at the end of the day. They have cash, but it's really easy to determine what cash is. But when we look at the bank stocks, this is going to be a lot more complicated. Okay, how about accounts receivable? This is a, a big line for this company. This is basically money that is owed to the company for their products. In corporate America, most products are sold on credit. They're not really sold in a uh, cash upfront kind of way. So if you're Mylan or Viatris, this company, you'll sell a pallet of pills, right? Like trucks load of pills to your to your distributor. Don't worry about the cash. Pay us when you can, right? Because you know they're, they're going to pay. If they don't pay, all right, well, you can get the, the pills back. So you do business that way. It doesn't work that way in retail or something like that. Banks don't really have accounts receivable. They have loans receivable. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, inventories are another part of what's called working capital. So inventories in this case are for this company around $3 billion. And inventories are just products that you haven't sold yet. And they could be work in progress or whip. They could be raw materials that you're stockpiled, um, like chemicals in the case of making a pill or, you know, possibly chip, you know, chip equipment, not chip equipment, but let's say, I don't know, chip parts, um, before you make the final chip, that's called a work in progress. Or it could be a good that you're finished and you just haven't sold yet. That's fully packaged and fully ready to go. So banks also don't have this because banks don't, aren't product companies. They kind of provide a service. So we're not going to see inventory or accounts receivable when we look at a bank balance sheet. We're really going to look at the, the financial assets the bank has and, and try to scrutinize those really carefully. And the point I'm making here is banks' balance sheets are 10 times harder to analyze than a tech company or a pharmaceutical company. Uh, they're actually really, really difficult because you have to comb through all of the fine print to see, well, what exactly are the bank's investments. Remember, the bank receives a liability. Their deposits are actually a liability because they end up taking all this cash in, but it's not their money, right? They're just holding it on. It's a deposit. So when they return the money, you know, there's there's going to be a, uh, a liability that that money is owed to the customer. So in the meantime, they get to invest the money. And that's kind of the problem with banks, if you think about it, right? Like, they're very asymmetric. Um, when you put your money in a bank, the, the bank's using it to make money for themselves. Uh, you don't get that money, right? They want to pay you the lo lowest possible rate to get your money in. And these bigger banks, they know you kind of have to bank with them. So they arguably don't have to pay you anything, right? JP Morgan pays nothing on their bank balances. Good luck, right? So it's very, very difficult to, to have to um, work with these banks, right? Like... Um, it's really frustrating uh, when there's there's just not that many banks to choose from, and they're not that interested in competing with you, um, uh, competing for for your business, I should say, not with you, for you. Um, they just don't care, and 
you know, in fact, they've gotten to a point where they can kick you out for, for not, you know, complying with what they, you know, feel you should be complying with. So anyway, prepaids are something all businesses have. Um, sometimes you, you buy products uh, for your company that you will use over time, and they're technically assets, right? So over time, you'll use those assets. It's kind of a sometimes called sundry items or other items. Um, assets held for sale are, are a special thing for this company. They're selling a part of their business. So those are assets that are, that'll be leaving the company. Property, plant, and equipment is, is arguably the most important element of any balance sheet, but not so much in financial companies, but certainly in most companies. The assets that a company has to produce its income are property, plant, and equipment. And these are sometimes called fixed assets, which are assets that are, have a useful life of over more than one year. So uh, a desk actually has a useful life of more than a year. A computer does too, but a paper clip doesn't, or, or paper for the copy machine doesn't, or water for the office is technically not a asset that you would depreciate over a year because it's useful life, it's expected to be consumed immediately. So even something like a, a, a payroll is a, use, is a useful asset, but it's only useful over, over a short period of time. Let's keep going here. So goodwill and intangibles are really big numbers for, for companies like this. And they're sort of accounting fictions that are just created from accounting. And this is going to be really important as we talk about this in a second, because this goodwill, so-called goodwill, is worth absolutely nothing, right? But look at the number. It's $33 billion, right? $33 billion, but it's, it's actually worth zero. Now, why do we have to put goodwill on the balance sheet? Well, it comes from an artifact of double entry accounting. Maybe argument artifact isn't the, the right way to put it. But um, when, you, when you buy a company and you buy, buy it for more than book value, you use that part that was more than book value and you have to put it on your balance sheet and you depreciate or amortize that over time. And what's funny about that goodwill, though, is it's worth nothing. It is literally worth nothing. Uh, but there's this concept that you didn't buy this company for more than its, than its uh, book value for no reason. So you must have bought it for some reason. And you could call that an intangible asset or goodwill. But it's, um, you know, you have to sort of do an accounting class. And I've done a bunch of these on, on YouTube if you'd like to really get behind what is goodwill or what is intangibles. But that is basically zero. And sometimes we have this thing called tangible book. And I really want you to think about that for a second because there's book value. Let me just get Microsoft Paint out here. Um, there's, there's book value, which is assets minus liabilities. Uh, and then there's tangible book, which is your tangible assets minus liabilities. I like to look at tangible book because at the end of the day, those, those goodwill don't mean anything to me. Right? I can understand what cash is. I understand what accounts receivable is. Accounts receivable is a real asset. You know, those customers are going to pay me um, or I'll sue them and get the money. In 90, you actually can only put on accounts receivable the money that you're likely to get. So if somebody's delinquent, it doesn't go in here. It gets charged off. So this is $4 billion the company is likely to collect in the next like 30 to 90 days. So this is to me is almost as good as cash. This inventories are soon to become accounts receivable which will soon become cash. And sometimes that's called the CCC, cash conversion cycle. Um, and prepaids are assets too, right? You, just because I paid for my salesforce.com or I paid for my Windows software doesn't mean it's not an asset. Until I use it, it's, it's sort of an asset of mine if you think about it that way. Like when you pay your rent, if you're prepaying your rent six months in advance, that's an asset of yours. That number will drop over time, but it's still an asset. This though, Goodwill, is worth zero. So as I sum up all the assets of this company, what do you notice? It's got $46 billion in assets. Well, that sounds like a big company, right? Wrong. You know, if you deleted this $33 billion, it's only $13 billion in assets. Let me put in the, the other things. Like they have this deferred tax advantage because they're a foreign company and they have other assets, which are $2 billion. So our numbers in Excel match the numbers in this SEC filing. The SEC filing says the company has $50 billion in assets. So basically, the real tangible assets are 17 billion. These are assets you can literally put your hands around and say, okay, this is real. Um, and we're gonna, when we look at a bank stock like JP Morgan, I think is the one we'll look at in a minute, we'll kind of try to get our head around what the tangible book is. Okay, so accounts payable is the opposite of accounts receivable. This is money you, you owe your vendors and you just haven't paid them yet. Um, debt is obvious, and debt is gonna become really important when it comes to. Bank stocks. This company has a ton of debt because they paid a lot of money to Pfizer to merge Mylan with Pfizer's 
one of Pfizer's divisions called Upjohn. So they have a ton of debt. And sometimes at this point, I like to put a line up here, which is not part of the balance sheet, but I like to do it myself just to look at it and say net cash. So their net cash is kind of what I think of as their net liquidity. So they have cash of a billion in the bank, but they have 18 billion they owe uh, bondholders. So they have negative net cash of 17 billion, which is quite a lot. And we're gonna see how to interpret that in a second. So they have taxes they owe various tax authorities. That's around 300 million here. Um, they have more debt that I didn't count, another 2 billion, or 1.2 billion, I should say. So that brings it up to 19 billion. They have, um, let's see, a couple more things here. Other current liabilities, which is kind of like a generic line of just other things, other money they owe, other non-current liabilities. Non-current means that they owe it, the, the amounts are owed over more than one year. So current means, in balance sheet talk, current means within one year, non-current means with one year or more. So this is where things get really interesting. They have another tax line here, 2432. Okay, so all the liabilities add up to, um, let's see, it looks like 29 billion. Let's see if my Microsoft Excel has the exact number. Yes, 28,950, and this says 28,950, so I'm satisfied I put the numbers in correctly. But here's the problem. If I added all these liabilities up, let's just do it over here. I would think that this company is solvent, right? Because they have 50 billion in assets and 29 billion in liabilities. But wait a second, we already discussed that that goodwill is not real. It's just an accounting thing. So they really have 17 billion in assets and negative 29 billion, or I'm sorry, 29 billion in liabilities. So their tangible, their book value is, let's put this number back in actually. book value and tangible book value are very different things. So the book value of a company is assets minus liabilities, 21 billion. But the tangible book value is negative 11 billion. There's a really old joke in value investing circles which says what's the definition of book value? And obviously the book definition is assets minus liabilities. But the joke definition is it's the most amount of money you should pay for a stock. And the, the point of the joke is that the book value is literally should be the bottom amount of value of a company. The book value is sometimes called the liquidation value, right? If you bought a company, the balance sheet becomes yours. Think about this as like a Quickie Mart or something like that. Well, you get all the cash in the Quickie Mart's bank account. You get all the money that the Quickie Mart's customers owe it. You get all the inventories on the shelves, you get all the prepaid assets, you get all the equipment, et cetera, et cetera. It applies to any business, whether it's a Quickie Mart or Viatris or a bank or anything like that. Um, but you also owe all the bills, right? You owe all the debt, you owe all the taxes. So when you break down what's the, what's the net net, what's the book value, it looks positive if you don't include the goodwill, if you include the goodwill, but if you take out the goodwill, which is not valuable, it's negative. So if you bought all the shares of this company and shut it down today, you would owe $12 billion. But the company has a value. The company is worth $12 billion. Why is the company worth $12 billion? Well, because the company makes money every quarter. And, and that's sort of the way you look at it. So as we look at the, sh the shareholder's liability, which is what makes the balance sheet balance, it's assets minus liabilities. So this is syn a synonym for book value, the shareholder's equity. And we, we add this up to make sure that it equals assets. And you can see the balance sheet balances because those two are the same number. So if there's any questions, I can kind of um, explain it a little bit more. Um, but I hope that is useful in terms of the way a balance sheet works. Now we're going to look at a bank balance sheet. It's going to be really interesting because it's a very, very different kind of look.